Born in Israel, Guy Horowitz is a partner at Deutsche Telekom Capital Partners, Deutsche Telekom's investment management group. With over 1 billion euros under management, DTCP invests financial and strategic venture capital across Europe, Silicon Valley and Israel. Guy has nearly 20 years of experience in commercialization of innovative technologies in the mobile, internet and enterprise software space, in startups, corporates and as a venture capital investor. He has held senior product marketing and product management positions in Takadu, Microsoft, Newstar and Comtouch and also served as a director of strategy at Modu Mobile. He started his venture career in Gemini, one of Israel's leading early stage VC firms. In 2012, Guy established and headed the first partnering and business development office of Deutsche Telekom outside Germany in his role as Vice President International Partnering and Venturing. In this role, he led innovation and entrepreneurship activities with dozens of startups and large enterprises around the globe. Throughout his career, Guy has worked with numerous entrepreneurs across different industries and has a deep understanding of what makes an entrepreneur successful. Today, he is implementing his learnings as a venture capital investor and lectures on entrepreneurship and innovation around the globe. Thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure being here, being in Japan, being in Puso Talks. It's been in the working for in the works for a while, so I'm I'm glad that it actually happened. And seeing all of you today, I'm actually curious to hear more about you and what you guys are doing and ladies are doing here in, in Fuso and in Fuso Talks. So I'll be around after we're done and happy to entertain any conversations you would like to have. First conversation I typically have with people that I meet is about sports. And today, Unfortunately, there's no German team that I can put on, uh, on the screen. No longer relevant. By the way, just show of hands, how many people in the room did not have their national team in the World Cup? Okay, that includes myself. OK, so about half the people are probably sad today because their team is no longer in the World Cup. And about half don't care at all, right? So uh, back when I started following football, you know, when I was a child, um, I became a fan of the German team. And that made me happy most of my life and most of my career, unfortunately not this year. Whoever is uh, rooting for the French actually remembers that in 1998, this nice picture uh, was for the first time ever a reality. So the French team winning the World Cup we don't know what's going to happen on Sunday. Um, there are not too many Croatians here, are there? Any Croatians in the room? Oh, there are some. OK. In that case, uh, I wish you luck. <laughs> uh, see, 4.2 million Croatians, and there are a couple in the room. That's brilliant. So um, in 1998, other than watching the World Cup, I was actually uh, graduating uh, from uh, university, and I took my first job at a large, is large enough Israeli company that was in the aerospace business trying to develop UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. Now drones are the thing, but at the time that was top technology, and also renovating um, aircrafts, airplanes for poor militaries for poor uh, uh, armies. Uh, that was a very nice experience for me, but I was making about five times as much money working as a tutor for an exam called the GMAT. So that's, if you know or do not know, it's an exam that's supposed to be predicting your success as a business student. And actually, a few of us, the person in the picture was my boss and the founder of that GMAT school. A few of us 
got so good at predicting what the computer is going to ask next that we decided that we might uh, try and uh, you know, create a piece of software that is able to predict what computers are going to ask you. And this way, we can crack the DNA of the cat. Uh, not this kind of cat, that kind of cat. Cat is computer adaptive testing. OK, so if you're able to crack that, you can actually build a software, maybe even a service, maybe even a business that offers testing as a service and preparatory testing as a service. So one of us said, as many people in the world said in 1999, hey, we have a startup here. I don't know if you remember what you were doing in 1999, but where I come from, everyone had a startup. And where I come from is Israel, as you've heard. And Israel, as you know, or again, maybe you haven't heard by now, is called by many startup nation. There's a reason for that, and we might touch upon that later. But in 1999, the name or the brand startup nation did not exist. But if I looked right, left, or center, every one of my friends, many members of my family, the waitress in the cafe, they all had startups. So we said, why won't we also start our own company based on that great idea that we had? So we've raised some money from a business angel, a rich guy. Not enough money to uh, actually take salaries, but enough to buy some computers and start working on our venture. This is the Hebrew word for entrepreneur. It's pronounced yazam. It's a very short word. And it actually means the person who has the initiative. Very short word, loaded with meaning. I want to contrast that with, uh, with your permission with some other ways to say entrepreneur in other languages, maybe languages you're familiar with. But you'll have to help me because you know my Japanese is not very good. So I kind of heard or learned that this is pronounced kigyoka or something like that. Yeah, kigyoka, OK. And I understand that this is the entrepreneur, or actually it means a business person, which means that I guess entrepreneurship in Japan is more about the business rather than the initiative. Maybe I'm wrong. Etymology has never been my strong side. But then within kigyoka, there's also kigyo, which is business, right? It's, I guess, easy. And then there's okoshi, is that correct? Yeah, Okoshi, which is uh, basically a purpose, right? Something that you aspire to do. And that's actually closer in meaning to you know, how I think of entrepreneurship. Now, this one is going to kill me. That's Hindi. Is it Yevesai? Any Hindi speaker? Yevesai. Hmm? OK, I was not that far. And that's, again, mostly around business, right? Yeah. So again, uh, longer and has to do with business, with making money. And last attempt is Unternehmer, which is, um, I guess, again, some sort of a business uh, uh, person. Which basically means that in different languages, in different countries, the notion of entrepreneurship comes from a different source and maybe drives you in a different direction. So um, when I thought of myself in 1999, I did not necessarily think of business. I did not even think I was an entrepreneur. I didn't know the word entrepreneur existed. I probably would have to look it up in the dictionary. And since Google Translate did not exist at the time, <laughs> I didn't know that entrepreneur is actually French for unemployed. <laughs> or is it? But, you know, everyone was doing it, so I did it as well. And the first thing that I learned about entrepreneurship is that odds are you're going to fail. Guess what? 
our startup was not successful either. But since, you know, France has just won the World Cup and there was another one coming up, one should always be aspiring to uh, win. There's always a trophy. There's always a, let's call it, a uh, bigger cause that you want to have in life and that you want to achieve in life. So the holy grail for us was not necessarily nailing that computer adaptive software, that first startup. It was trying to go for the world championship, trying to be the best at what you are. Now, you know, sometimes even the best in what they do fail. That's fine. Take those two nice gentlemen. So you can be messy and be, you know, World Cup holder, world champion four years ago, and fall flat on your face. You could be Ronaldo just two years ago winning the European Championship and basically crashing out. You can have your dreams for that trophy that you're dreaming about broken in front of you. And it's fine because it's okay to fall if you can rise. If you cannot rise, that's another problem. So the concept of failing actually has within it the idea or the notion of falling, but also rising, trying to learn from what you're doing, not just cry about it. Entrepreneurship, just like football, starts from a tender age. But when you're a first timer, you're not aware of the odds of failure. Or if you are aware of them, you do not pay much attention to them. If you have the skill, if you have the passion, if you have the ability, you don't care about the odds of failing. You just want to play. You want to be part of that. And this is why I really like as an investor to invest in first timers. I actually like as much to invest in third timers, veterans. Not those kinds of veterans, but you know, I'm happy to invest in someone who's already been around. Because what is a third timer? A third timer is someone who's made it at least once, typically twice. But even if he's made it once and failed once, that's great because failure is also part of the experience, of part of grooming you as an entrepreneur, as someone who aspire and achieve for better. If you haven't failed yet, you cannot succeed. Unless, of course, you're a superhuman, you're a great entrepreneur, in which case you will have succeeded once and twice and the third time around. I definitely want to invest in that kind of person. What is the problem with second timers? Everybody likes second timers, right? We talk about second timers. They've been around, they've done something. Why don't I prefer to invest in second timers? Because the second timer actually means that the first time around, she or he was successful. And now they're just cocky because they've succeeded. They have not tasted failure yet. Had they tasted failure, they would not be second timers, right? We just call them losers or failures, which is wrong. It's OK to fail. But someone who's already been successful and has not yet tasted failure will probably make mistakes. I'll tell you a story about such a person in a few minutes. But before we get into specifics, and specific stories, just want to make sure that we all understand that it is OK to fail. Not just OK. I believe that failure has received a uh, reputation that is unfair. We associate failure with a bad thing, you know, the F word. But again, I think what drives us is the ability to learn to take what we've seen in the failure and apply it in the future. I think of the word fail not as a word, rather as an acronym. 
as a abbreviation. So to me, fail is, am I allowed to say f here? Go ahead. Yeah? After last year, I guess, you know, I, I can call people by <laughs> names and it's still going to be OK. It's fine as long as you adapt, you change. You do not try to do the exact same all over again. That's you know, Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Is trying to do the exact same thing and expect a different result. So as long as you change, it's fine. And keep doing it. Iterate. Don't just stop at once. You know, you've made a change. It doesn't work or it works better but not perfect. Keep trying. Keep changing. And finally, learn. You can make mistakes. You can change. But if you don't have a process of learning from it, of understanding what has worked, what has not worked, and how you could potentially work better next time, your work is not complete. So fail is adapt, iterate, and learn. I think we've talked enough about failure. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about something else that entrepreneurs have in common. And in my career, both you know, in corporate, in Microsoft, Deutsche Telekom, and as an investor, I've met hundreds, maybe thousands of entrepreneurs, many of them successful. I've had the pleasure to invest in some of Israel's best entrepreneurs, maybe some of the best in the world. And I've always been asking myself, can I identify the common denominators, the commonalities between successful entrepreneurs, and can I actually identify talent or a great entrepreneur when I see her or him and avoid investing in guys or ladies who are not great entrepreneurs? So what are those common traits? What are those common denominators? And will I, as a professional, be able to tell them? and tell them apart. Well, you know, I'm just a guy, and I do not necessarily have all the knowledge in the world. There are people that have researched this and written about it much more than I have. Two of these gentlemen are in this picture here. By the way, there's a guy and there's a Horowitz here, so maybe, you know, I'm somehow, somehow related to this. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have Guy Kawasaki. And on the left-hand side, you have Ben Horowitz. So if those two names don't mean much to you, there's still a chance to fix that. They've both written great books, and they've both been quite successful in what they've been doing. So Ben Horowitz is a serial entrepreneur. He's also the founder of a venture fund called Andreessen Horowitz, or A16Z for short. And along with his partner, Mark Andreessen, they've actually reinvented, reimagined venture capital. So he's not just an entrepreneur and not just a repeat entrepreneur, but also an inventor of a new kind of way to do venture capital. He's written a lot about the topic of entrepreneurship, what makes entrepreneurs tick, tick, what keeps them up at night, and how they can live with it. And that book, which is kind of the Bible or the New Testament of entrepreneurship these days, is called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. How many people in the audience have heard about the book? OK, there are a couple. Anyone read the book, God forbid? OK, this is my recommendation for today. At least one book, if not two, that I'm going to uh, name today, I think are you know, worthwhile at least uh, you know, reading uh, the cover of, maybe even the entire thing. So the hard thing about hard things is for many entrepreneurs today a guiding light. Because he talks about the hard things, about you know, why being an entrepreneur is not all rock and roll in the good sense of it. Why things might go wrong, how they might go wrong, and what you do in situations where they do go wrong. 
There's another book about entrepreneurship. If, if the hard thing is the New Testament, then this book is probably the Old Testament, the original Bible. It's called The Art of the Start, written by Mr. Kawasaki that we saw before. Anyone heard of The Art of the Start here in the audience? OK, another recommendation. A short book, very concise, and very entertaining as well. Taking a, let's call it, more positive look at the life of the entrepreneur. So Mr. Kawasaki outlines in this book some sort of a recipe, but also a, let's call it, a vision or a model for entrepreneurs. And he draws this sweet spot, as he calls it, the intersection of opportunity, expertise, and passion. So a good entrepreneur would probably have the expertise, will have identified the opportunity, and will have the passion to go after it. Makes a lot of sense, right? There has been some argument around Guy Kawasaki's model. Because you know sometimes you might think something is an opportunity where it's really not. And sometimes something that does not look like an opportunity is actually great. So think of Elon Musk and his SpaceX, right? So space travel, reusable rockets. Does that sound like an opportunity? Maybe nowadays it does, but 10 years ago, probably not. Digging tunnels throughout the city, maybe not so much. Electric cars, oh, actually sounds like an opportunity. He had nothing to do with electric car, car, cars before he started working on it. So expertise might not necessarily be a must for the entrepreneur. As you can see, it's debatable. The one thing that's not debatable, though, is passion. Being passionate about what you do Having the motivation, the desire, the calling, waking up every day knowing that that's what you want to do is the number one key to a successful entrepreneur and entrepreneurship. Thinking about your business or about your venture as part of you, something that if you stop doing will not happen, is basically what drives the greatest entrepreneurs. If you're just waking up in the morning thinking this is someone, someone else's idea, or you don't care about it anymore, or as you were caring about it before, either this venture is not for you, or you're not for this venture. So I'm no Guy Kawasaki, and I'm no Ben Horowitz, but I'm Guy Horowitz, so maybe I should come up with you know, a model of my own. I, well, it's not much of a model, but it's a concept which I call the four eyes. Not in the uh, German sense of vier Augen. This is a different kind of four eyes. This is my way of thinking of the drivers, what makes entrepreneurs tick. And again, it's based on learnings that I have from meeting those hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs and asking them, what makes you tick? What keeps you up at night? What drives you in the day? The first I is invention. Not to be confused with innovation. We're all talking a lot about innovation. I think we're, we're going to be talking about innovation today. Invention and innovation are not the same thing. They're related. To invent is to come up with something that was not there before. Not everything that you invent is innovative, and not anything that's innovative is actually an invention. Think again about Elon Musk, SpaceX, right? He did not invent rockets, but the concept of reusable rockets is an invention. Electric cars, the Tesla, again, there is not much innovation in the technology itself. There is in the way it's applied. It's an invention that drives uh, Mr. Musk, and he keeps inventing new ideas. The Boring Company is definitely another uh, that needs to be mentioned here, Hyperloop. So 
inventing things from scratch is something that drives great entrepreneurs. And it's not just the ability to imagine it and make it happen. It's also the ability to start something that did not exist before, what we call inception, the genesis, that start that Guy Kawasaki is talking about. If someone has already started it, it's probably inferior from the entrepreneur's perspective to something that they had started themselves. So the notion of co-founder, I founded something and someone co-founded it with me. Typically, there is someone there who thinks he started it or she started it first. Yeah, sometimes two people get together and think about something together that did not exist before. And in that, no, in that respect, this notion of co-founders is really co-inception of the company. But it's not enough to imagine and invent and start from scratch. You actually have to have influence on the life of people for your venture to be exciting and fulfilling. So many entrepreneurs say that the only reason their venture exists is because they're able to influence and inspire people make a change for people's lives, businesses, the way they uh, act and behave. And lastly, but definitely not the least, interest. A great entrepreneur will take interest in their venture as if it's part of their own life, of their own body, it's an organ. So, Having personal interest in the driver for your business is something that really bothers you, something that really makes you, you know, excited is really a big difference between a great entrepreneur and someone who's just doing something to be called an entrepreneur. And maybe I'm culpable of that, at least for parts of my career. But I had the fortune to work for a great entrepreneur called Dov Moran. This guy has invented the USB hard drive, also fondly called disk on key. I had invested into Dov's company, but not this one. This one was a great company. It got acquired for 1.5, over, over $1.5 billion. I have invested, my fund has invested into Dov's next company, which was also a his brainchild coming from his pain and his interest, he wanted to reinvent mobile phones because they were too big and bulky to carry. Unfortunately, that venture in which we have invested and I actually joined as an executive failed. And it failed not because it was a stupid idea. Well, maybe it was. But... Uh, it failed because at the same time that Dov had his great idea to minimize phones to a small form factor and then put them in different enclosures for different types of activities or different parts of the day, there was another gentleman, also a repeat entrepreneur, once successful, once failed, who came up with a different idea exactly that same year. So $120 million later, we declared defeat. Company was shut down. But Dov is still a great founder, a great entrepreneur. He has made it once, he failed once, and guess what? He's learned from it. He had a few more successful ventures since, and he's now a venture capitalist as well, investing in other people's ideas and bringing a lot of his experience into those ventures. So Dov is definitely one of my role models for a great entrepreneur, despite the money that I've personally lost on the failed venture. So Mr. Jobs is asleep now, or you know, definitely uh, resting in peace. Um, and Dov is also uh, typically resting, but not in peace. He's very, very active, thank God. And he sleeps very well at night. I think that's the one thing that made me always wonder, how can you sleep so well when 
So much money is on your shoulders, 120 million down the drain, and you can sleep so well. And Mr. Moran, Dov Moran, always joked that he sleeps like a baby. How can you sleep like a baby with all that responsibility? But yeah, I sleep like a baby. I wake up every two hours and cry. <laughs> so I think the one difference between a great entrepreneur and anyone else is the fact that you actually have two minds. You're two people in one. You are that baby, in a sense. You're still exploring the world as if it's the first time you're seeing it. And you do sleep very well at night because you don't know any better. That's the only way you live. And there's the grown-up who's already seen a lot, has experienced a lot, has the capacity to fail and still wake up the next morning and go on about his or hers idea. And guess what? Sleep very well at night. So two different personalities, two different people, four eyes sleeping extremely well, all four eyes shut at night. And I think that's what really makes entrepreneurs were great, unique. They have those two mentalities, two personalities. They're able to have both of them at the same time and still be very, very relaxed because failure is just part of the successful journey. Thank you very much. There's something I've always wanted to do, so if you can switch back. Yeah, yeah. I always wondered what it would be to say uh, one more thing. So I'm not Mr. Jobs, but I do have a, an invitation to make. Let's call it the fifth eye. Uh, I would like to invite you to Israel. So I don't know how many of you have been and how many of you had liked to come, but I think Israel is a great place to experience innovation, both on the country level and also on the individual level. So please, if you don't know how to get to Israel, talk to me. If you uh, want uh, recommendations about who to see and who to meet, talk to me. And if you want to hear more about my experiences, Happy to uh, share those with you after today. Thank you again. Bye-bye.